2019, Scatman, leader of the Franco-American community in Southbridge, published a book titled, and please excuse the pronunciation with the Irish accent, Histoire de Franco-America and uh, Southbridge, Massachusetts. This book was written in French and until a few weeks ago was not available in English. So, as you can imagine, the book being available now in translation, thanks to uh, Dr. Blood, it's a huge breakthrough and we're very appreciative of being part of that whole process in being hosting this event here this evening. I would, before I finish up, I would just like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that we have this area here which has been devoted to uh, Felix Gatineau and his memories and thanks to his family members and to Union Saint Jean Baptiste we have been able to put some exhibits together. So uh, we have added um, actually a couple of pieces. The last piece that we added was just added uh, just a couple of days ago. <coughs> it's the Felix Gatineau Prix d'Excellence en Francais and it's a medallion that the library was able to purchase and uh, we were able to uh, get a really nice uh, shadow box and put it into it and display it. So I would just like to thank the Last Green Valley, Union Saint Jean Baptiste, the Friends of the Jacob Edwards Library, and lastly, but not at all leastly, my colleagues who supported the whole program this evening and without whom we wouldn't even have as many chairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome everybody, and I hope you enjoy the program. The program is being recorded and will be available on YouTube. So, for anybody who wasn't lucky enough to be able to be here this evening, please let them know that in a couple of weeks, thanks to the cable TV uh, station, we have people here tonight, Jim and Mark, and they are televising, so it will be available in about two weeks. So, welcome everybody. Um, I am not a historian and I am not the author of this book. Um, I am a French professor from Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, I teach all levels of French language, culture, and literature courses. Um, I also teach courses on translation. Uh, and I do research on Quebec studies and Franco-American studies as well. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about this book, um, which I had the honor of translating. Um, I am not from Southbridge either. I am from uh, New York originally myself. My grandmother was uh, Franco-American. She immigrated from uh, Quebec with her family when she was a teenager. Um, so I do have a connection to the Franco-American community and um, to this, this work which um, I had the pleasure to translate. Um, so, I want to start off um, where I started, which was I was contacted by Alan Earls, who is the editor and publisher of the book. Um, he has his ancestors were Franco-Americans here from Southbridge, and he had known about this book for quite some time and was unable to read it because he doesn't read French that well. Um, so he said, wouldn't it be great if we could do an English translation? And I jumped on board and I said, great, let's go, let's meet in Southbridge. I want to do a tour. Um, see all the sites and so we went to the statue which you all probably know that's here on Main Street and my initial reaction was great it's it's already translated in French and in English um, but when I got closer to the statue I realized that the English side and the French side were completely different um, the French side of the statue tells all of the things that uh, Felix Gatineau did uh, that's related to the Franco-American community in Southbridge and in the United States and the English side talks about everything he did to contribute to US society um, he was a state representative um, all of the things that he he did throughout his life that contributed to larger American society not specifically Franco-American um, on the French side, there's a little sentence that says, his public life spanning 50 years was full of honor, devotion, and service to his ethnicity. Um, the English side says, while ever retaining his affection for the land of his birth, he achieved the highest type of citizenship in his adopted country. For 50 years, he served the community faithfully and well in offices of honor and trust. 
he was a citizen of the sort of which America is justly proud. And for me, this um, sort of is a metaphor for Felix Gatineau's thoughts about who he was in terms of identity. Um, he was strongly Franco-American, really invested in the French-Canadian community, both here in the United States and back home in the homeland that he left behind. Um, and also equally dedicated to being a citizen in the United States of America. Um, he, he had this strong sense of patriotism which overlapped both cultures, right? Both nations. Um, and we see that throughout the book. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to read it yet, but we will be selling some later tonight. Um, throughout the book he talks about this deep sense of patriotism that he felt to both nations and it's, they don't conflict in his mind, it kind of overlaps. Um, his love for French Canada and his love for the United States are almost one in the same. Um, and throughout the book you also learn a lot about uh, Felix. I'm going to call him by his first name because I feel like I've spent a lot of time with him in the past year. Um, he's a very interesting character and although the book is history, it's historical, there, there's a, a lot of factual information, um, he's not shy about telling you his opinions about things. So as you read through the book you really get a good sense of who he was as a person. Um, he is someone who was dedicated to um, public life. He was a civic leader. He cared really deeply about the development of society. He was also someone who was highly opinionated. He has very strong opinions about particular issues um, related to the Franco-American community, but also someone who is really compassionate and um, really proud of the people in his community. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, more about Franco-Americans. Maybe many of you know this already. Um, but when I'm using the term Franco-American, I'm specifically talking about people who are descendants of French-Canadian immigrants. Um, sometimes people think Franco-American could be any kind of French background. But um, in uh, academia and in the, in the context of New England, Franco-American means descendant of French-Canadian. right? And Sometimes I use the two terms interchangeably. Um, so who are the Franco-Americans? So between the 1830s and 1930, there were about a million French Canadians who left um, French-speaking Canada to come to the United States. Um, the vast majority of them came to New England. Um, some left earlier, if, if you can see on this map, we have um, an earlier migration in 1755 that came from Acadia. That was after the great deportation that happened um, in Acadia. And then we have the rest of the French Canadians coming down into New England. Um, mostly some earlier on in the 19th century, but mostly late 19th, early 20th century. And as you see here, by 1900, there were many Franco-American centers in New England. Um, the darker circles show you places where the, there was a French-Canadian population greater than 20 percent. Um, and we see Southbridge is one of those dark circles. Um, Southbridge is a little bit unique in terms of Franco-American communities uh, in Massachusetts and in, in New England in general because although there were only 6,000 French Canadians here in 1900, they represented 60% of the population. So they were the majority, um, which is not the case in most other centers. Um, the nearest center uh, next door was Fall River. Um, it was one of the largest. It had 33,000 French Canadians, but they were only 30% of the population, so they were still a minority. Um, why did people come here <laughs> from French Canada? This is a very long question. Um, I'm not going to give you the full answer, but just a brief sketch um, for those of you who don't know. So New France um, was the colony founded by French immigrants um, beginning in 1608 with the settlement of Samuel de Champlain near Quebec City. Um, similar to New England, which was just to the east and the south, right? Um, 
but by 1750 New France was quite large. Um, it spanned from the eastern provinces of Canada through the Great Lakes and all the way down to Louisiana. Um, so it was a very prosperous colony for the French until um, the middle of the 18th century, the Seven Years' War, which uh, many French Canadians called the British Conquest. Um, this was a time when the British came in, perhaps you've heard of the Battle on the Plains of Abraham in Quebec was part of this um, period. Um, so the British took over in Canada. Uh, and that led to um, a difficult situation for many French Canadians. Um, many French Canadians suffered oppression, discrimination, um, lack of education, lack of economic opportunities. Um, and so they uh, started to organize. And I'm, I'm pointing out this particular moment in history because it's significant for Southbridge. Um, in the early 1830s, a group of rebels organized to try to fight against British domination in the province that is now Quebec. And then it was Bas Canada. Um, and they mounted several failed rebellions, um, so they tried to overthrow um, to get back some of their rights. Uh, it didn't work out for them. Um, and this is the time period when we see the first big wave of immigrants coming to Southbridge. Um, and that first early wave of immigrants came from a particular town called saint ours in Quebec. And saint ours was the location of the first assembly of the Patriot Rebels in Quebec, um, which was in May of 1837. So there's definitely a link there between this historical moment and the emigration of some French Canadians. Um, but in general, most French Canadians, if you ask any historian, will tell you that people didn't leave for political reasons, they left for economic reasons. Not because of the snow, they liked the snow. Um, but there was sort of a push and pull. So you have um, a population boom in Quebec around the late uh, 19th century, um, not enough land for people to feed their families. And then you have the, the revved up industrial revolution happening in New England and all of these factories who needed workers, right? So a lot of people left um, to come to the U.S. specifically looking for jobs in the mills. Sometimes the mills would send recruiters up to French Canadian towns and cities and recruit people to come down. Um, but they came here mostly for jobs, right? Some thinking they're moving here forever. Some thinking they'll just come for a season or two and then go back to their farms um, later on when they have more money. So why specifically come to Southbridge? Um, well, by the mid-19th century, there are at least five big factories functioning here. We have the, the Globe Manufacturing Company, the Russell Harrington Cutlery Company, the Columbian Cotton Mill, the Hamilton Woolen Mill, and American Optical um, by the mid-late 19th century. So there are plenty, plenty of jobs um, for people who wanted to come here. And there was also a small, very small French community already established here in Southbridge. Um, Felix will give you the entire history of these early settlers, who they were, why they came here, what they did for jobs. Um, but the first person he talks about is Claude Dugas, who came in 1755. So you'll note that's around the time of the Acadian deportation. Um, and then 1832, the first Quebecois, French Canadian, right, a Abraham Marois, who came from the town of saint ours He uh, found work doing the construction of the Globe Manufacturing Company. Um, and then we see this first big group of people coming right around the time of the Patriot Rebellions in Canada, 1837, 1838, Potvin, Giard, Mathieu, Jantes, Daigle, Dumas, Bourassa, Laflèche, all from saint ours right? 
um, some, of the, some of the descendants in the house here. Um, and Felix, he doesn't stop there. He gives you a list of all of those early immigrants, um, at least a, a couple decades worth of names of people, where they came from in Quebec, and um, how they settled here in Southbridge. Um, <clears throat> so Felix, I want to tell you, give you a few anecdotes so that you um, know a little bit more about him, as I've come to know him. Um, he had a lot of empathy for these early settlers, um, for the situation they were in that forced them to leave French Canada, but also um, he talks a lot about the um, ways that the French Canadian elite denigrated those who chose to leave. Um, they sort of looked down on them and condemned them for giving up on French Canada and, and going to the United States. Um, so I'm just going to read you a quote here. He says, these unfortunate immigrants, driven out of their country by poverty, were shamelessly denigrated, hated, even considered to be rejects that Canada was proud to be rid of. But even in their tattered clothes and all that poverty, there were good hearts, noble souls, who painfully felt the insults slung at them. So he has a lot of compassion for these early settlers and what they had to go through, both in leaving their homeland and in coming to a new land where they didn't speak the language, right? Um, but he also is, uh, had some criticisms of some of those earlier settlers. Um, he gives us a full list, and this is just a partial screenshot, um, of people who came here with French names and the names were changed to English names. Um, so for example, you have Roy, Roy, when they came to the US became King, right? Or Lapierre became Stone. Um, and he, uh, he did not like this. <laughs> um, he says, quote, as far as we are concerned, we have only contempt and disdain for those compatriots among us who are embarrassed by their origins, by their names, and by their faith. They are a disgrace to our ethnicity. So he very strongly felt that people should, coming to the US, not give up their original culture. They should hang on to that culture, to that heritage. Um, and this um, corresponds to what we know about the early Franco-American community. Um, there's a famous saying, qui perd sa langue, perd sa voix. So if you lose your language, you'll lose your faith. Um, so these were the two pillars of identity for Franco-American immigrants coming to the U.S. Keep your language and keep your Roman Catholic faith, right? Um, so for Felix, these people who gave up on these things when they came to the United States just to maybe have an easier pathway, um, he, he doesn't look favorably upon them at all. Um, so I'm going to tell you now, he uh, sort of breaks the book into various sections. Um, and he's going to explain to you what happened to these uh, French Canadian immigrants after they came to Southbridge, right? So he, he, he gives you the whole background of the early settlers and who came here. And then he explains how this community grew. So it chronicles the founding and growth of the Franco-American community and the establishment and growth of all of the institutions that supported that community in Southbridge. We're going to start with religion. Um, so in Southbridge, as in other Franco-American ethnic enclaves around the late 19th, early 20th centuries, life revolved around the church, right? And the church was not just a spiritual center. It wasn't just where you went to pray on Sundays. It was part of your daily life, right? So it was um, involved in maintaining cultural traditions, guiding social behavior, and having a well-established parish um, for French Canadian immigrants was a marker of um, establishing themselves here in the United States, right? So we have a parish, we have a church, um, we are now part of American society. So we see here the um, first Notre Dame church, which was built in 1870. 
Um, there were some, uh, they did worship earlier than that, but in other churches, um, sometimes in people's houses, if they would have a passing um, priest come by to say mass in French or do a marriage or a baptism. Um, and we also have here the rectory and the first convent that were built um, along with the church to support the priests and religious women who came here um, to serve the community. Uh, we have the second church, which had just opened a few years before Gatineau wrote his book, which was 1919, right? Um, so he, there's an elaborate description of this church, how they, how they got the funding, how they constructed it. He describes in detail the interior of the church. Um, he was very proud of this church. Um, and he really had an admiration for all of the religious men and women who serve the community. Um, he goes into detail with descriptions of the biographies and histories of the various priests who were the main priests in the, in the parish. Um, he talks about the vicars. He talks about the religious women who came to work in the schools. Um, and he really admired them and saw them, he saw the parish as an extension of the French Canadian community in the US. Um, when describing the Sunday masses, he says, quote, it's the good old religious Canada, tucked into a corner of a country protected by a grand old flag. Um, and one of the anecdotes that he tells about the church was about the purchase of the property for the new church. Um, the parish priest then was Father Brochu, and he contracted to purchase the Marcy property, which was a house that uh, was on the location that the new church is now on. Um, and this contract was drawn up in 1895, but the church wasn't built until um, it was finished in, in 1916, right? So Felix describes what happened. He said, unfortunately, during the transaction, there was a clause that the pastor did not sufficiently take into account. The old man who had sold him the property insisted on remaining in his home until his death, and the parish had to wait until his end to realize their dream. The poor old man was quite elderly, but like all mort mortals, he loved his life and would leave it only when God decided to end it. So there was a long period where, after they had purchased the property where they had to wait um, before the construction would, would start. Um, and they built the beautiful um, Notre Dame Parish, which is still there today. Uh, along with the uh, church, the parish school was an essential um, institution for retaining language, religion, and culture. Um, the Brochu Academy, um, built by the same pastor, was constructed in 1899, although they had classes earlier in other locations. Um, and the book describes the establishment of the school, um, the first graduates. Here we have a partial list of the early graduates starting in 1905. We have Bédard, Blain, Prou, McDonald, um, Allard, Desolniers, another Allard, Senecal, Deloge, Gagnon, etc. And he lists these. You'll, if you're, you have ancestors who went to this school, you'll probably find them among these lists. Um, and and what kind of diploma they received, whether they got the parish diploma or the diploma from the diocese. Um, and the school, uh, Felix always felt, was an essential part of um, maintaining a Franco-American community. Uh, he writes, quote, a priest knows from experience that a Catholic school in the parish is indispensable. Without such a bastion for religion, for patriotism, the abandonment of religious and nat national beliefs becomes all too frequent. So he was always worried about this concept of people losing their language, losing their faith, losing their patriotism for French Canada, right? Um, <coughs> Here we have the class of 1919, so this was the year the book was published. 
You see um, the graduates surrounding the parish priest, and he lists all of the, the names of the people who graduated in that year. So politics, also a big topic for um, Felix. He was very involved in politics and he had great admiration for his fellow countrymen who became involved in um, the U.S. political system. Uh, in order to integrate into U.S. history, people had to become citizens, they had to vote, they had to hold offices to protect their interests um, in business and in society. So Felix gives us a description of all of these early politicians, um, people who held both uh, appointments and elected posts in the city of Southbridge and in larger um, venues. We know um, Felix was himself a state representative. Um, we have here Monsieur Tetro, FX Tetro, who was the um, first Canadian elected to the legislature, and Alexis Boyer, Jr who was a senator from Southbridge. Um, Felix was also a great proponent of naturalization. This was a controversial topic at the time. Some people felt they did not want to get their American citizenship. They came here thinking, we're just here temporarily, or we don't want to renounce our, um, our relation to our homeland. Um, but Felix was a was a big supporter he felt that the only way that people franco-americans were going to be able to improve their lives here in the u.s is if they took an active role if they became american citizens and if they went out to vote um, he notes that in 1875 there were 3,000 french canadians in southbridge but only 25 of them had registered to vote um, and through his, largely his involvement with a number of different organizations, um, some of the clubs that were established in Southbridge, they offered um, citizenship classes, English classes for people who maybe um, didn't have the English skills to pass the citizenship test. Um, by 1919, there were 1,200 voters. So they had increased in 25 years um, exponentially and so by 1919, French Canadians were the majority of the electorate in Southbridge. Um, he also, aside from politics, talks about everyone who got involved in the city business, right? If you were on the school committee, or the library committee, or the sewer committee, um, you were a tax collector, um, a city councilor, he, he mentions all of these people by name and um, really calls out the importance of their contributions to the city of Southbridge. <clears throat> Along with um, serving through public office, um, Gatineau was very uh, insistent on the importance of military service. Um, he writes, quote, when the country needed people to defend it, when dark clouds began to gather on the horizon, signaling a coming storm, when there was a possible threat against the great flag that shelters us, our compatriots did not turn a deaf ear. At the first call, at the first cry of alarm, they promptly jumped in to assist the country, and a good number of them died protecting our rights. In doing so, they covered their names, their families, and their fellow citizens with glory. So very proud of the service, and he goes back to the Civil War. We see here um, Franco-American veterans of the Civil War and the Spanish-American War. Um, obviously the book was written shortly after World War I, so he mentions by name each of the 500 Franco-Americans from Southbridge who were either drafted or enlisted in World War I. Um, we see an image here of the 16 Franco-American Southbridgers who died during the World War I. Um, the center uh, person here is a man named Arthur Riendo. Uh, he was the first to be killed uh, on the battlefield in World War I, um, June 7th, 1917. And uh, we have over here his sister, Emma Riendo, 
who also enrolled to help out the American military in World War I. Um, I had a really fun time researching this. She was one of the Hello Girls. I don't know if you've heard of them, but during World War I, the American uh, Army needed bilingual telephone operators to work in France. So they wanted young women who were educated and who were fully bilingual in French and English so they could operate and uh, help the American troops to communicate with the French on the ground there. And so Emma Riendo was one of those women, there are a couple hundred of them, who were um, brought along over to, to France to help with World War I, called The Hello Girls. It's a great book about it. If you Google it, you'll, you'll find it. Um, so it's in larger society. Felix was also very, very active. Um, there were a number of clubs and organizations that offered opportunities for Franco-Americans to socialize, but also had other functions. So they organized cultural activities. Um, there were a number of musical events, performances, theatrical troops, um, lecture series. They provided financial services. Um, a lot of immigrant communities didn't have access to the kind of banking services that more established um, Americans would have. So these societies often functioned um, as a life insurance, right? So the members would pay an annual dues and then if someone was injured or died, that that organization would make a payout to that family. So it's sort of like an early form of life insurance. They also had savings clubs where they would teach people how to save money and the importance of compound interest, which you know I wish I had known when I was younger. Um, and one of the organizations that was really important, um, oh, and also political functions, I'm sorry, they also are the ones who held the evening English classes and the naturalization citizenship classes, um, voter registration events and things like that. Um, so one of the, the groups that was really important in uh, Southbridge was the Saint-Jean-Baptiste Society, um, which was its own club here in Southbridge for a while and then later um, merged with with the national organization, which is the Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste d'Amérique, which still exists today. Um, this society was really important in organizing patriotic events. They held banquets. Um, they were had a mutual aid fund. Uh, and here are just some of the um, members of the Saint-Jean-Baptiste Society. Those are the officers. And some of the events that they had, they would, the, this club was also a great way for them to connect with other Franco-American communities in the area, right? So there would be um, meetings that would be held where uh, uh, regional or national meetings where different St. Jean Baptiste societies would come together to discuss issues that were important to the to the Franco-American community. Um, they also went to each other's parties too. That was part of it. Um, and here we see. Uh, I don't know if you can read this up here, but between 1870 and 1908, the Saint-Jean-Baptiste Society paid out almost $58,000 to people who were ill or orphaned. Um, and then they paid another $23,000 in insurance to widows and children of people who passed away, members who passed away. That's a lot of money, I think, at, at that time. Um, and it, it really provided an important service and a kind of security for Franco-Americans living uh, in that time. Another, oh, I should mention, Saint-Jean-Baptiste um, is the patron saint of French Canadians. When the first French settlers came to New France from France, um, Saint John the Baptist was their patron saint. So this was always a holiday, a religious holiday that was celebrated in French Canada. Um, and the, they often had children dress up like Saint-Jean-Baptiste. So you see the saint is often shown with a lamb carrying a staff with a banner on it, maybe pointing to the sky. And um, on the feast day, they would pick a child from the town to dress up as Saint-Jean-Baptiste. They often had parades or floats, um, parties or events like that. Um, so this was initially a purely religious holiday that Franco-Americans brought with them from the homeland um, and that continued in the U.S. 
And also in Quebec, um, today, June 24th, Saint Jean Baptiste Day is the national holiday for the province of Quebec. Um, Canada's national holiday is July 1st. Um, that's Canada Day, but June 24th is the uh, Quebecois national holiday. Right? So they have parties and, and everything. Um, thought somebody was raising their hand. I feel like I'm in class. Um, so one of my favorite anecdotes from the book um, comes from the Saint Jean Baptiste Society. Uh, they were organizing a patriotic celebration. Um, I had a hard time reading the book tr knowing when uh, patriotic meant the United States and when patriotic meant French Canada because he kind of overlaps them. Um, and that's the case for this event. It was a 4th of July party that was organized. There was a mass at the church, a parade, um, an outdoor picnic, and then there was going to be sp uh, speakers coming, and then a dinner, and then a uh, a play that evening that everyone was invited to and they invited Franco-Americans from other communities in the area to come. Um, but this particular one, which was in uh, 1881, um, as the group, uh, the parade made its way to the, the picnic grounds, which were outside, um, this is the arch for the, the entry to the picnic grounds, a huge storm came in and it started pouring rain. And so the whole thing was destroyed, everyone went away. Oh, these are some pictures of um, children from Southbridge uh, dressed up as Saint Jean Baptiste. Um, so this, they had planned, planned and planned for this big event, it poured rain. Um, and then there were some other issues. Um, the committee that was supposed to order the pies for the event, I don't know if these were dessert pies or maybe the French Canadian meat pies or salmon pies, right? So this probably was the meal for all of the people. Um, they were supposed to have ordered 600 pies, but two people on the committee got confused and they each ordered 600 pies. So they ended up with 1,200 pies. <laughs> And he said they teased them mercilessly and called them the pie committee for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and he said, um, so they had gone to all this trouble to get these 1,200 pies over to the field for the picnic before the parade arrived, and then it started pouring. And Felix says, we do not know, in fact, if the pies had become a bit dry during their long pilgrimage to Southbridge, but the heavens in their mercy watered them anyway. <laughs> visitors had not yet even had the privilege of gazing longingly at the first offerings when the storm, that ruthless storm, intervened and destroyed at least half of them. Oh, our cherished Saint Jean Baptiste pies, what a cruel fate awaited you. The following week, <coughs> the committee had to go from door to door selling the rest of the pies at the original price paid. Were they any less delicious, these cherished pies? History has been silent on the matter. <laughs> Doctors tell us, however, that there were several rather serious cases of indigestion in the community around that time. So just a fun little anecdote to me shows um, maybe with the, how much the community had fun together doing these kinds of activities. Um, and I, I really just, <laughs> I like the way that he teased them merciless, mercilessly. Um, another important group was the Cercle Canadien. Um, this group also offered patriotic events, speaker series. They had a theatrical group that did plays, um, plays in French, both written by um, French Canadian and French authors, so sometimes Moliere, sometimes Louis Frechette, um, and they also did a lot of political organizing. Um, some of the speakers they had come to Southbridge include Honoré Mercier, who was the Prime Minister of Quebec from 1887 to 1891. He came here in 93. Um, Louis Frechette, uh, who was a famous Quebecois author. Um, some of, they put on some of his plays, but he also came as a speaker. Um, a lot of the topics centered around political um, questions, naturalization, repatriation, civic duty. Um, some of about what was going on in, Can in, in French Canada at the time. And Félix Gatineau was a guest speaker for the Cercle Canadien, presenting his history of the Franco-Americans of Southbridge. 
Um, and one of the uh, one of the anecdotes I like about this uh, this group was their organization of a Patriots Day celebration. So it was just after Patriots Day had been named an official holiday in Massachusetts, they decided they were going to do an event um, that at that time it was also called Paul Revere Day, and Paul Revere was of course of French descent, um, and so they had decided to do a reenactment of the ride of Paul Revere. And um, Felix had been asked to be to play the role of Paul Revere and to ride down on a white stallion into a crowd of people, um, yelling the charge to bear to arms. And then the the fireworks would go off, and there would be a mock battle um, like they do now in in Lexington on Patriots Day. Um, so they had this whole thing planned out. Um, and so he went to Webster to get his white stallion to ride down into Southbridge, but someone had gotten there before him, a prankster, um, taken the horse and taken off a half an hour before him, went charging into the crowd, the fireworks went off, the battle happened, and then Felix wandered in on this old mare that could barely walk. <laughs> Everything was over and he missed the whole thing. And he was not happy at all. He said, quote, as a reward for his devotion, Paul Revere was unable to walk for almost a week. <laughs> a consequence of his bumpy ride from Webster to Southbridge, mumbling swears at the president, Joseph Leclerc, for having roped him into this hellish chore. <laughs> Um, so another fun uh, event, and, and he doesn't stop there. Um, these are two of the main organizations, but he, there are about a dozen or so different clubs and organizations that he describes who the members were, what their mission was, what kind of activities they did, how they contributed to the society. Um, so again, uh, just a wealth of information. Um, if anyone is looking at their genealogy or looking up to find out what their ancestors were involved in, you can probably find it in this section. Um, he also gives a lengthy history of the various musical groups and bands that were formed in Southbridge. Um, we have the Blanchard family band here, who are relatives of the publisher, Ellen Earls, um, and the brass band, which seemed to be very popular. All of the different uh, Franco-American centers had brass bands, and they would bring them to these different parades and events and they would march and, and do performances. Um, the last section of the book deals with professional life. So we mentioned that most French Canadians, when they came here, found work in the mills. This was the case for Felix. He came here at the age of 20. He initially had a job um, working in one of the mills. Which mill was it? The Hamilton factory. Um, later, he got a job working in a grocer slash pharmacy store in town and worked his way up to owning his own business. Um, and then from there, became a politician and a civic leader. Um, he was actually president of the National Association of the Union Saint-Jean-Baptiste d'Amérique for 10 years, I believe, right? We have a representative here from the organization. Um, so the book, uh, he talks a lot about the lives of French Canadians and was really proud of their successes economically and professionally. Um, he talks about the doctors, he gives little brief biographies of the doctors, the journalists, the musicians, the bankers. Um, here we see doctors, dentists, and lawyers who were Franco-Americans from Southbridge. Um, he also talks about Franco-Americans who um, worked their way up to becoming manufacturers themselves, to opening their own manufacturing companies, or to becoming executive directors in some of the, the mills that were in town. And in the, in the end of the book, he gives a complete list of all of the businesses and uh, professional people who were, low, who were um, working in Southbridge at that time. So insurance agents, architects, um, real estate agents, lawyers, doctors, contractors, um, barbers, jewelers, bakers, shoe 
store people, dentists, um, milk, milk delivery people, right? So he has the names of all of these people and what they did in terms of professional life and contributing to the economy in Southbridge. And so the book was published in 1919. <coughs> in 1919, there were about 15,000 people in Southbridge, and 9,000 of them were Franco-Americans. So they were the majority. And Felix um, describes this year, he says, in this year of festivities, 1919, from the church to the city hall, the Canadians of Southbridge reach out to each other. They hold great authority in municipal affairs and impose their will everywhere. Southbridge is really just a little corner of the province of Quebec, where the sublime starred flag is harmoniously framed by the maple leaf, the emblem of the incessantly renewed vitality of our ethnicity. Um, and I threw up the um, Franco-American flag here. This was, did not become the official Franco-American flag until 1992, so way after um, Felix's time. But I think he would have appreciated the blending of the U.S. symbolism, the red, white, and blue, and the star, with the Quebecois symbolism of the fleur-de-lis. And so where are they now? Perhaps you can tell me more than I can tell you. Um, but in a study done in uh, Maine in 2012, they found that there were over 2 million um, New Englanders who identify as Franco-American, about 11.5% of the population, making Franco-Americans the third largest ethnic group after Irish Americans and Italian Americans. Um, and this is significant because Franco-Americans, unlike Irish-Americans, Italian-Americans, we still see Little Italy's, right? Everybody celebrates St. Patrick's Day. There's still Chinatowns in different cities, right? But you don't see the Little Canadas anymore um, that much. I mean, there are still some around, but um, they seem to be more invisible than these other ethnic groups um, in, in the way that they have been sort of merged into general American society. Um, and so it's my hope that people reading this book will gain a, a better understanding of what it was like for French Canadian immigrants coming to um, Southbridge in particular, but to New England in general, um, or even my ancestors were from upstate New York, and I felt reading this um, a real affinity to my ancestors and what their lives must have been like and uh, how they lived and what they, what they did for fun. Um, so I, I think it's a great way for, for average people even to understand this moment in the history of Franco-Americans um, and in general to understand the process of immigration. Um, so I want to take some questions, but before we get into that, I just want to thank uh, Alan Earls, who is the editor and publisher of this book, and the person who um, came to me with the project and asked me if I would be interested in doing it. So he's really the one that's, that was the driver behind this whole project. I um, also want to thank Margaret Morrissey, where is she, um, the librarian here at Jacob Ed Edwards Library. She's been fantastic in supporting this project um, and organizing this event tonight. And finally, my colleague, Leslie Choquette, who is in the audience somewhere. Um, she is back there, the director of the French Institute at Assumption College, where there's a large collection of Felix Gatineau's works and memorabilia. Um, and she also wrote the um, wonderful introduction to this book um, and is a real Franco-American historian. So <laughs> if we if there are questions I can't answer, perhaps she can jump in and help me out. Um, but I'd be happy to answer anything that I can if anyone has any questions about the book. Yeah? Did his book sell well at the time? Did his book sell well at the time? I actually don't know. Um, I know that... 
There are a few in circulation. Um, um, Margaret showed me, oh, there's one right there. Um, Margaret showed me a copy that she has that has an inscription written in it um, by Felix. He, he would give them out to people as wedding presents and things like that. Um, so I'm sure there, there are a number of them around, but. Was the French, like a uh, proper French, or was it uh, a local, like colloquial French? It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, it was standard French, right? He wrote very, very proper, beautiful French. Um, French Canadian immigrants who came here brought with them their language from Quebec, um, which is, I always tell my students, Quebecois French is to France French what American English is to British English, right? So it's a version of the same language, accents a little different, some vocabulary is different, um, really minor, some grammatical differences, um, but generally two versions of the same of the same language and, and the book is written in, in really lovely um, proper standard French. Did you replicate the photos that were in the original book? Yes, so the photos that are in my presentation here are all taken out of the book. There are hundreds of images in the book um, that have been reproduced in the English translation version. So you'll get to see all of those and be able to read the, you can't read the captions here because it's too small, but see who all the people were and maybe identify um, some of your ancestors. Where was Felix buried? Where is Felix buried? I do not know. The old, the old Notre Dame Cemetery. Page Hill. Yeah. Oh, yes. You sent me a picture of it. It's a small. Um, it's in the ground. A small headstone. Nothing fancy. But he left the book behind. So. <laughs> On July 26th, I had a copy of Felix Gatto's book in French. The friend let me borrow it, took it home at 8 p.m., sat up reading it until we left, and suddenly saw that my house was on fire. Oh, no. <laughs> my house burned to the ground, but Felix Gatto saved my life. Oh. I was in bed at 10. <laughs> <laughs> so... Looking out for the everybody in the community, I guess. <laughs> Great. And what's your name? My name is Pat Canada. Pat Canada. Pat Demes. Demetz Canada, who grew up here. So she's got a book about the two migrations of the French to New France and then. The plugs. <laughs> it's okay. And then from New France into the U.S. Who did he marry? I think he married my grandfather's sister. Um, you know what? It's interesting in the book, although he lists himself really often, <laughs> um, he'll list, you know, members of the Cercle Canada. Yeah, Felix Gatineau, um, people who were appointed to the library committee, Felix Gatineau. But he doesn't talk at all about his personal life um, in the book. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm not really sure. I, he mentions some other Gatineaus. I think maybe one of his daughters um, founded a club for women, which seemed to be a little bit original at the time. Um, but I don't know offhand what his, what his ancestry is. expresses this concept of patriotism. Um, so it's, it's something that's really deeply ingrained in him to want to promote um, both French Canadian culture and 
and American citizenship. Um, and so I think that really he's driven he's driven by that. Um, he also was a successful business person. Um, he in talking about the clubs, he often mentions you know how much money they made on an event or how much money they paid out or um, you know what kind of profits were they were able to do from a, a certain fundraiser. Um, so I think really motivated by success, um, coming as an immigrant, starting out working in the mills, and then becoming this successful, important person um, in, in Southbridge and in Massachusetts. Um, but really that deep, it's that deep uh, concern for his heritage and wanting that to be carried on to the next generation. Um, he talks about the book in the introduction saying that this, I'm writing this, all of these stories, um, not just to brag about all of the great things that we did when we were here, but to leave it as a legacy for the future generations so that they can carry on the work. I can answer that lady's question. Okay. <laughs> um, he married Odile, uh, O-D-I-L-E, Giard. Odile Giard. Mm -hmm. G-I-A-R-D, a native of Southbridge in 1882. In 1882. Odile Giard. And I assume he had several children. Uh, that was my question. Most people did back then. <laughs> the, uh, I know there were bilingual schools, I'll say, um, here in Southbridge and Spencer. How long did those go to play? When were those? So when the book ends in 1919, um, the Brochu Academy is doing fabulously well. They have um, hundreds and hundreds of students, I think maybe close 600 or 800 students. Um, and that classical education, I mean, that's an education that people will pay a lot of money for today, right? Those parish schools were able to offer a classical education, bilingual, rigorous education that would allow those kids to go into college if they chose to. Um, many went to Assumption College nearby that also was bilingual, um, had a strong French program. Um, but when the school closed, I'm not really sure um, if Southbridge is like other Franco-American centers, probably around the 50s, um, 50s, 60s. So a lot of the mills started to close around that time. Um, the highway system is being built, um, the factories are moving down south, uh, and the, the communities start to disperse, right? So people are now educated, they're professionals. Um, instead of living in their parents' home in downtown Southbridge, maybe they buy a house, um, right, move out into the suburbs. So that was, it was around that, that time, mid, mid, late 20th century. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're just starting in Massachusetts now to, to build new French immersion programs, and, um, you know, they're, they're not accessible to most people. <laughs> One of my neighbors over here just so probably brought it up on Wikipedia. If you look up Felix Gatto. He had seven children. He had seven children, yeah. Yeah. And um, there is a lovely biography of him on the French Institute website um, at Assumption College. So if you're interested in learning more of the details about his life, um, they have, that's up online if you, if you search there. While you've got this crowd gathered, out of uh, curiosity, by a show of hands, how many people think they might be related to him ancestrally? Quite a few. <laughs> so those seven children had lots of other children. <laughs> and many of you are here tonight. <laughs> um, we have been in contact with some of Felix's descendants, in particular his granddaughter. Um, her last name is Martel. What's the first name? Barbara Martel. She uh, wrote a, a very nice letter to us um, asking to uh, thanking Margaret for keeping her informed about the translation and asking us um, what motivated us to, to do this translation. Um, and it, it really is um, 
my interest in the Franco-American community and Alan's interest in the Franco-American community um, just sort of came together and we were able to, to bring this to people who probably didn't, might not have had access to it um, if they don't speak French. <laughs> Are the books available tonight? The books are available tonight. We're, uh, we have a number of books we're selling for a special price of $10 as long as they last. Um, we'll have them for sale in the back here, right, um, as soon as we're done. It's also available on Amazon. Other questions? Well, thank you all for coming here and... Um, Alan. And if you're interested, come back and, and purchase a book. And I'd also love to hear your stories, who you are, and um, if you're descendants. <laughs>